Oh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another video for History Vibe Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Dennis McDonald, and today we're going to be discussing the formation of the Gospel of John. So welcome back to the show once again, Dennis. Thank you, Jacob. It's always a pleasure. Likewise. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, we'll pull up this uh, image. Okay, so what is it that's happening here? You're, you're, you seem to be cataloging a list of parallels between Homer, Mark, John, and other texts. Yeah, if you could scroll down just a little bit, that's a, that's that's great. Um, Jacob, I'm going to take liberties to set a context for all of this. Um, I love the Gospel of John, um, but it is so misunderstood. And uh, I think it's important to uh, get a sense of where the misunderstandings are. The first is that the John that the gospel is attributed to is not John, the brother of James or Jacob, the son of Zebedee, that is one of the disciples. It's another John that is usually called the elder John, who is known by Papias and was the author of the three Johannine epistles. And he becomes the person called the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John. But the first two editions of the Gospel of John probably did not name him, but it simply was an anonymous treatment as um, the synoptic Gospels, at least Matthew and, and Mark, seem to have been. So that's the first thing to understand. The second thing to understand is that it was composed in three consecutive stages. The first stage I call the Dionysian Gospel, because as we'll see, it portrays Jesus uh, as a rival to the Greek god of wine, Dionysus. The second um, edition I call the Anti-Jewish Gospel. That is, the Gospel of John contains passages that are extremely hostile to Judaism and represent a strong break between the author and his, uh, his audience and the, uh, the synagogues. And it's probably, uh, it's almost certainly sparked by the exclusion of followers of Jesus from synagogues, which became very painful for this community. And uh, they lashed back um, with really vicious stereotyping. Um, so that is a, <laughs> it takes this, the Dionysian gospel, which is really a rather refreshing document, and turns it into a piece of polemic. The third is uh, uh, edition of the Gospel of John is much more congenial. It recognizes that there are other Gospels, and um, it tries to say, okay, we accept those Gospels, but the one that was written by the beloved disciple, our man, uh, that is the elder John, is the one that we will cherish. But that edition uh, of the Gospel of John very possibly, in my view, is likely the beginning of a Johannine corpus that included, after the Gospel of John, 1 John, then 2nd and 3rd John, and then the Apocalypse of John. Now, that's more than we need to bite on today. So I'm uh, just going to say that the... Uh, the Gospel of John is a very complex and fascinating document and so badly understood. There's nothing, almost nothing in this gospel that can be considered historical apart from what the primary author, the author of the Dionysian Gospel, inherited from the synoptics. Now let's go back to that text screen that you had, Jacob. Um, these are places where you have similarities between the Gospel of Mark, 
who's in the second column, and the Gospel of John, which is in the fourth column. And uh, you can see on the left-hand column uh, places where Mark seems to be imitating Homer, that is, in the Odyssey and in the Iliad. So the following passages in the Gospel of John um, are ultimately derived from Mark's imitations of Homer. It's another reason why mimesis is so important, that is, literary imitation, is so important to understanding the Gospels, not just the Synoptics and Acts, but also the Fourth Gospel. So here we have the purging a den of thieves, that is, the cleansing of the temple, a feast for 5,000, Jesus walking on water, Peter's recognition of um, the Messiah, the anointing woman at Bethany, the triumphal entry, Peter's vow to die, Judas's betrayal at Gethsemane, Peter's violation of his vow uh, to die with Jesus, the favoring of Barabbas over Jesus, Jesus's mockery after his trial, um, certainly the crucifixion. Then you have mourning women and Joseph of Arimathea rescuing the corpse. And those all have passages in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, um, from Homer. So the, the Markan evangelist uh, imitated Homer to create those characters and those episodes, and they reappear in the Gospel of John. Now, why then would the author of the Gospel of John bother to rewrite the synoptics? In my view, the Gospel of John is a sympathetic um, complement to the synoptic Gospels. It's a supplement, if you will. And the supplement is to show that Jesus is not just the hard-nosed martyr who expects his followers to pick up their own crosses and to uh, give up the wealth and to follow him despite the hardships of discipleship. Because that kind of Jesus is not going to be a good rival to another um, important uh, religion in the Greco-Roman world, namely the Dionysian religion. Dionysus is the god of a good time. He not only creates wine, he's a god of love and revelry and madness and eternal life if you eat his flesh and drink his blood. And this becomes a, a challenge to the author of the earliest Gospel of John to have Jesus as a rival who also knows how to have a good time. So the first miracle that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John is not an exorcism in a synagogue, as in the synoptics, um, but the uh, changing of water into wine after the guests at a wedding are drunk. Um, that cannot be by accident, and even in antiquity, people saw that that was uh, a uh, was modeled after the uh, the Dionysian cult. The same thing's true of the Johannine version of the uh, the so-called Eucharist. It doesn't happen um, at a meal just before Jesus dies. It happens. Um, very early in the gospel and where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Well, that's the uh, omophagia of the Dionysian cult that offers those who ingest um, uh, raw uh, flesh, um, they will have eternal life because Dionysus himself had died and, and uh, been raised. And the, the, the author notifies the reader immediately that Jesus is going to play a role similar to Dionysus. And this was recognized in antiquity and by Byzantine authors. It's the famous monologue of, um, of Dionysus at the beginning of the Bacchae, which informed the famous prologue of the Gospel of John. 
So that, uh, I think, sets uh, something up for a discussion. That is, the Gospel of John is not finally written until about the 130. It came was produced in three consecutive um, uh, stages. Its original stage was complementary to the Synoptic Gospels, but attempted to transform Jesus into a donor deity, which is similar to what you'd have in the Dionysian cult. Later, the, that gospel, uh, the first gospel of John, was not good enough for the anti-Jewish faction, uh, probably the work of a, a number of uh, followers of the elder John, that lashed out against Jesus, uh, Judah, uh, Jews for the uh, exclusion of Johannine Christians from their fellowship. Um, and then the final redaction was an attempt to pull together the Johannine tradition and to uh, make nice with the other synoptic gospels and those who valued them, but to reassert the primacy for them of the, the gospel of the beloved disciple. So, um, and the, the, the author uh, uh, attributed, uh, the, the title attributed to the gospel uh, later on as the gospel of John is not the gospel of John, the disciple of Jesus. It's the John, the beloved disciple of the Johannine community, namely the elder John. Now I'm going to scroll down because you got something else going on here. Did you talk about this excavating the three uh, Johannine Gospels with social identity criticism? Um, again, I'm going to just give a little background. We have several documents in the New Testament that are ascribed to a John. The one we know best is the Gospel of John, but as I've said, it probably was created in three different stages. There are also two apocalypses of John, at least, because we can see in the, uh, in the text that the beginning and the ending of the document is written in the third person about the author and must come from a separate hand. And the orientation of the beginning and the ending of the apocalypse of John uh, really seems sits uncomfortably with the, uh, the the prophecies. So the prophecies came first, and then we had the uh, the the form of the God, of the apocalypse that was ascribed to a John. The name John never appears in the middle section, and then we have three epistles of John. 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John. And one of the great problems that we have, we know of a synoptic problem, but there's also a, a similar Johannine problem. That is, how do we understand the intertextuality of these eight stages of Johannine literature? And the best way to understand it, I think, is in this way. Um, to say that the Johannine epistles came first, probably in this order, 2nd John, 3rd John, and then 1st John. And around the same time, we have the earliest version of the Apocalypse of John. Then we have the, uh, the second version of the Apocalypse. No, then we would have the Dionysian Gospel, then the Anti-Jewish Gospel, then the uh, Beloved Disciple Gospel, and I think at the same time, probably the second edition of the Apocalypse of John. So that's the Johannine problem. Um, and if you'll go back to that document that we, we just had, I'll, I'll walk you through it. The canonical Gospel of John, uh, can you scroll back up um, a little further? Um, the canonical Gospel of John resembles a Hopi Pueblo, a single building consisting of multiple adobe dwellings built atop each other, such that one house's ceiling becomes another's floor. The second building retains the earlier one largely intact and adds to it. The third building does much this, does the same with the second. 
archaeologists bent on monitoring the history of the Pueblo must begin with the most recent stratum and dig down to the first to discover date and interpret its earliest Anasazi stratum. Similarly, this methodological prolegomenon, that is to volume three of Synopses of Epic Tragedy in the Gospels, first will target the most recent and canonical reception, which I will call the Beloved Disciple Gospel. The next layer down is the anti-Jewish gospel, and the earliest layer is the Dionysian gospel, which supplements the synoptics with mimesis of Euripides Bacchae. All three compositional strata post-date the Johannine epistles, the earliest stratum of the Apocalypse and Papius's exposition. Now, um, if you'll scroll down just a little further, Jacob, you'll see how I try to um, present the tra my translation of the texts of the Gospel of John. So in the right left-hand corner, a corner uh, or a column, you find the Dionysian Gospel. And there you have uh, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Why can I not follow you now? I would lay down my life for you. But apparently the beloved disciple gospel added um, a duplication. Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but later you will follow me. And then a repetition, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, um, we find such repetitions uh, or opere, um, yeah, operia, I guess, um, in the Gospel of John. And uh, you, the arrows under um, the AJ Gospel, that is the anti-Jewish Gospel, and the BD Gospel, the Beloved Disciple Gospel, indicate that the content to their left is repeated. Now, there may be other adjustments that we can't judge, and I, I'm sure there are. But this is the best I think one can do at this point to stratify the composition of the gospel. So let's take a look at the example then that's below. The anti-Jewish gospel um, reads, Jesus answered and said to them, I performed one deed and you all are amazed and so on, which gets picked up in the beloved disciple gospel. But when you find that Moses gave you circumcision, an editor realizes that it's not from Moses, but from the patriarchs, that is from Abraham, that we get, you got uh, circumcision. So then it makes that uh, correction and you circumcise a, a person on the Sabbath. Now, there are other scholars who, many other scholars who have argued for compositional complexity and sequencing in the creation of the fourth gospel. But to my knowledge, no one has tried to stratify it the way I have here. And the advantage is that you can read the gospel in, in stereo, actually in three voices. You can hear what the Dionysian gospel says because you can just read things on the left-hand column and go straight through the gospel. You can also do the same thing with the anti-Jewish gospel. So you add the Dionysian gospel to the middle column and you get what was going on there. And if you want to see what the entire piece is like, you just read all three columns and um, work through the gospel of John that way. So uh, I think this is a major um, contribution of my synopses. But to my knowledge, People are interested only in the synoptic gospel section. Some are interested in the, the, the second volume on the uh, Acts of the Apostles, which we talked about um, recently, Jacob. But the, I don't know anyone that has really seriously engaged um, the, uh, the Dionysian gospel, uh, that is the B beloved disciple gospel. So can you uh, elaborate on Luke's mimesis of the Bacchae and John's gospel? The, this um, is something that many people are not going to uh, buy into very easily. Um, but the, 
the um, Dionysian gospel almost certainly knows of or knew of and redacted the gospel of Luke. And if so, it's the early extant example we have of such a, um, an imitation of uh, Luke. And it's also likely that when the, this Dionysian author was uh, redacting Luke, it, the, the Lucan gospel was still attached to the Acts of the Apostles. And I have a section of the uh, synopses that makes that case. At several points, you can see that it must be the case that um, the author knows the Acts of the Apostles. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about the Acts of the Apostles is that it has its own imitations of Greek poetry, the Iliad, the Odyssey, but also of Euripides Bacchae so that Paul becomes both the, um, the god fighter, Pentheus of the Bacchae, but then converts and becomes a Dionysian character himself. And at several places, the Gospel of John is presenting Jesus as a, 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 as a Dionysian character by imitating the same motifs that you found in the Acts of the Apostles. And I find that impossible to imagine unless the author of John knew and was redacting the uh, Acts of the Apostles. So just as um, Paul in Acts is Aeneas of the Onesus, I, by the way, see, I see you have a wrong accent on the honest, so I've got to correct that. Um, the, uh, just as Acts has Paul as a Neus of the Onesus, so does the Gospel of John. Now, let's take a look at this uh, example of the uh, wedding feast, um, and uh, let's do it dramatically. Um, so, um, no, you can scroll back up, if you will. Yeah, we're going to read this text, and what I'm going to do is read the Dionysian Gospel part, and then you're going to read the text that's indented, which seems to have come up, from, you know, come from someone else, and you'll see immediately how Dionysian and um, celebrative this text is. And on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples, too, were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, What to me and to you, woman? Jacob? Can you read? One, one second. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find it. Is it the text below? Um, it's the, the, the one that, uh, it begins on, and on the third day, a wedding took place. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. I and so, uh, and on, okay. On, and on the third day, a wedding took place in Canada. No, no, no. So what you, I want you to read is the second part of verse four. So I read, and Jesus said to her, what to you and to me, uh, what to me and to you, woman? And my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, do what he, whatever he tells you. Six stone water jars were standing there for the purification of the Jews, each containing two or three liquid measures. That's a huge jar. Uh, Jesus told them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw it out and take it to the chief steward. And they took it, and when the chief steward tasted it, the water had become wine, and he did not know where it came from. And the servers had drawn it new, and the Steve chief steward called the bridegroom and told him, everyone first presents the good wine, and then, when people are drunk, the inferior. But you reserve the good wine until now, that is, until after the people are drunk. Jesus did this beginning of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And then After you'll read, this, yeah, he went you down to Capernaum 
he, his mother, and his disciples, and he stayed there not many days. Now, I want you to scroll down just a little bit, Jacob, because we have an amazing text in a Greek novel written in the second century um, that scholars have said, and I think rightly, um, shows knowledge of this passage in the Gospel of John. So I'll read the left-hand column, and uh, you can read the right-hand column. And the names there are Clitophon and Lucippi. Jesus and his disciples are invited to a wedding. Clitophon narrates his, day, his stay in Tyre, where beautiful Lucippi <laughs> sang him a love song, filling him with desire. Later, the couple would marry. The wedding guests get drunk. Then came dinner and wine that fanned the flames of passion. As the young people became tipsy, the gift of Dionysus is the food of Eros. The wine runs out. <coughs> the Telpon tells how the Tyrians discovered wine. A poor farmer invited, invited Dionysus to a meal at which... Jesus turns the water in the stone jars into wine. For God turned the farmer's water into wine. Continue. When he, the farmer, drank it, he was back with pleasure and said to the God, O oh, stranger, where did you get this purple water? Where did you find such sweet blood? And the reason I have the Greek text there, uh, Pothen, where... Um, this is the, what the uh, wine steward says uh, in the Gospel of John. Um, I don't know where you got this uh, this wine. How did the how did the water become wine? And uh, the, so I think these parallels are really quite striking. And well, I guess we don't know if the author knew the Gospel of John, but may have known of the tradition that Jesus turned water into wine as a part of a Dionysian-like celebration. So I'm going to scroll down a bit further. So can, can you talk about this test case, Mimesis of Dionysus' opening monologue in the Johannine prologue? The beginning of the Gospel of John is very famous because it actually is poetic. And in this translation, you can see that I set it up in poetic lines. And occasionally the anti-Jewish gospel adds to it. And when it does so, it breaks up the poetry so that you can see the poetry then becomes more prosaic as you go along. Um, most scholars have, who have thought that the Gospel of John was created in sequences have attributed this passage to the last version of the Gospel of John, where you have a, a, an extensive poem that begins um, the, the book, and after this then you have um, the baptism of Jesus and so on, which uh, it, one would get from the synoptics. In my view, however, this is the, um, the beginning of the Dionysian gospel. In the Bacchae, when um, the, the scene opens, Dionysus, a god who declares that he is the son of Zeus right away, says why he has disguised himself as a mortal priest. He's done so because he wants to come to his birthplace and punish them for thinking that his mother Semele um, did not birth him by the god, but by a private um, tryst with a mortal. And so he comes to punish uh, Thebes, and he does so um, brutally by the end of the play. Jesus, however, is going to uh, hear the author uh, tells the audience who Jesus is, why he has become flesh, 
why he comes to his own, why his own did not receive him. But Jesus comes not to punish, but to give life. So uh, I'll read this, even though the the, uh, text is small. And uh, you can read again, if you would, the things that are indented. Um, I enlarged the, the, I'm sorry? I enlarged the text. I zoomed in. That's, yeah, very good. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was a God. This one was in the beginning with God. Everything came into being through him, and without him, nothing came into being. Okay, that is the uh, the God of the Jewish Bible. And now the Logos is um, <laughs> going to be, uh, uh, said later, is the Son of God. So that's similar to Dionysus, right? What came into being through him was life, and life was the light of humans. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not overcome it, like the... Um, um, the people in Thebes who did not uh, accept um, Dionysus. There is a person sent from God whose name was John. This one came as a witness to bear witness of the light that he all might believe in him. This person actually is a character similar to Cadmus, um, who was the one person, who, the father of Semele, who... Um, uh, cherished his daughter. So he was the one exception of the Thebans. Um, he was not the light, but was to bear witness about the light. The true light that enlightens every person was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and the world did not know him, like the uh, members of Thebes. He came to his own regions and his own people did not receive him, again, like the Thebans. But as many as receive him to them, he gave authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, those born not from blood, nor from a will of flesh, nor from a will of a man, but from God. And the Logos became flesh and pitched tent among us. That verb is the same word that is used for skinny, that is for the, uh, where we get the word seen, that is the stage for uh, a tragedy. And we observed his glory, glory of a one of a kind father from, uh, a child from the father, full of grace and truth. John witnessed about him and cried out, saying, this was the one about whom I said, the one coming after me was before me because he was before me. For we have all received of his fullness, gift after gift. That is, the uh, Logos gives life, unlike Dionysus, who pr- produces death and destruction. For the law was given through Moses, and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one ever has seen God, but a one-of-a-kind God, the one in the lap of the Father, that one revealed him. The lap of the Father, I think, is a nod to Dionysus, who was born from the thigh of Zeus. Um, the word kolpas there simply means the uh, a, a lap. It's a cavity. It's the same word that's used for a harbor in Greek. So when do you think that these three stages of the Gospel of John was written before it was assembled in the 130 CE? Um, Well, I think we can say that the anti-Jewish Gospel was stimulated by the expulsion of Johannine Christians from synagogues. And so this was a counterattack. Um, We don't know precisely, at least I don't know precisely, when that um, uh, break took place, uh, presumably early in the second century, because uh, Papias and and others still seemed, and John the Elder himself, seemed to have been quite content to um, be Jewish 
mm. and to stay inside the Jewish community. So the Dionysian gospel accepts much of, uh, as far as we can tell, all of the anti-Jewish gospel, but wants to make nice. And so mm. it then has um, an acceptance of other gospels. And in fact, in the epilogue, it says that the Jahainian Christians accept Peter as the shepherd of Jesus's flock. Hmm. So um, they see, concede that most Christians at that time were Petrine Christians, but they're Johannin, and uh, they like their gospel better, and it shows uh, a, a rather generous spirit. And so this is where the Johannin corpus likely comes from. It's a collection of the letters and an apocalypse attributed to him um, uh, to, 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 to archive his memory. The Dionysian gospel, though, really stands out. And it's not just because of the, uh, the stuff with Dionysus. Um, I have criteria similar to ones other people have used to tease out what the earliest version of the Gospel of John would be as opposed to its later accretions. So um, that's that really gets in deep in the woods for criteria and so on. So I don't know if we want to do that. Hmm. But um, I'm certainly not the only person to have argued that the earliest stratum of the Gospel of John is distinctive from its later heirs. So basically, you think the first two parts of it, probably early second century, and the and the, and the earliest part of it, and then the third, the third and final piece of it, was probably written by the same person that assembled the gospel. The, uh, of God. Oh yes, I think uh, I think they're they're one and the same. The 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 person who assembled the third volume, and actually, it's not one yeah. person. He says that, that these are brothers, and he uses okay. the first person plural. We um, we do this, we do that. So, um, so it's probably an author who's yeah. representing a group, and they're trying to honor the memory of the uh, beloved disciple who recently had died, but must be uh, as a very old man. Um, if the Dionysian gospel knows the Acts of the Apostles, it must itself be really quite late because the Acts of the Apostles may not have been written until about 115 or 120. And so um, I don't think the production of the Gospel of John in its three different movements took very long. I, I, don't, I think it must have taken less than a decade. Do you believe in a signs gospel source <laughs> that's a very intelligent question um and i can tell that you've been doing some research um hmm. almost all of the signs that one has uh attributed to the sign source which is still a current um position for many johannine scholars appears in the johannine gospel because Dionysus himself was a miracle worker that way. So the uh, raising of Lazarus is a very good example. The Dionysus is a life-giving uh, is a life-giving deity. The water, uh, the, the providing water to the Samaritan woman is a feat that Dionysus does to the Minads and the Bacchae who are in the wild and he provides them water and wine um, copiously. And uh, and it's at the it's at the base of a mountain. And the Samaritan woman says, "We worship in this mountain." I mean, the parallels are really quite striking. The uh, the story of the uh, the uh, um, feeding of the five thousand and walking on the water they appear in the so-called assigned source. But of course, Mark already Luke <laughs> John already gets them from Mark, and Mark got them from Homer. So, um, no, I don't believe in a sign source at all. I think it is a very clever and progressive interpretation of the Gospel of John for the time. Because at that time, nobody was talking about imitations of classical Greek poetry. But when you add mimesis criticism and the synoptic use of Greek poetry to create these stories, and then you see the stories repeated in John, 
you have to talk about a literary connection between them and not just popular oral traditions about Jesus. Well, I think we can conclude there. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dennis. Really okay. enjoyed this conversation. I did too. Thank you, Jake, as always. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.